Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm so happy that I have to re don't have to repeat these goals every time again and again. But I want to take you back to when they were conceived. This was in the year 2000 when world leaders gathered at the United Nations and they all signed the Millennium Declaration. And in this they pledged, we will spare no effort to put an end to poverty. We will spare no effort to ensure that all kids go to school. We will spare no effort to radically reduce child mortality, maternal mortality, to reverse the AIDS pandemic, etc. all by the year 2015. Now, indeed, in this century, it is for the first time in human history that our world actually has the resources, and we do have the knowledge to achieve these goals. And all nations participated in the Millennium Declaration and signed for this at the highest political level. So we actually have the political commitment and the consensus on what should be done by whom. The goals brought together for the very first time in history a shared vision of what development was about and representing that global partnership based on a shared responsibility by all countries. So developing countries accepted that they have the primary responsibility to achieve these goals. But rich countries, for the first time, acknowledged that in that goal eight, in global partnership, that poor countries cannot do this by themselves unless we rich countries do a better job, increase our aid, improve its effectiveness, trade, uh, change the rules of international trade to give poor countries a fair chance on the international markets. And I will get back to these issues later. But first, the good news. How did we fare since 2000? Now, over the last decade, the Millennium Development Goals have definitely spurred action across the globe. Many poor countries' governments have improved their policies. They have improved their governance. And rich countries have taken some, not enough steps, to increase the level and effectiveness of their aid. And progress across a large number of countries, a large number of sectors have been the result. The goals help, did help lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, saved lives, and ensured that children attend school. They have reduced maternal deaths, expanded opportunities for women, and increased access to clean, safe drinking water and freed many people from deadly and debilitating diseases. And in fact, the number of people living in extreme poverty has declined in all regions of the world, and thus the global target of halving it proportionally has already been achieved. Also, the safe drinking water target, by the way, which is part of the seventh goal on the environment, has been achieved already five years ahead of time. And regarding the AIDS goal, Indeed, new HIV infections are declining, led by Sub-Saharan Africa, and the numbers of AIDS-related deaths is declining, thanks to huge increases of the number of people that receive treatment. And the same is true for malaria. Intensive control efforts have already cut death from malaria by 20%, particularly in Africa. And the tuberculosis target is in reach. And on education, we see major advances have been made in getting kids to school in many of the poorest countries, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, beating all historical records. Alas, on two goals, the news is less promising, both on child mortality and on maternal mortality. It has been reduced by a third, and that is huge progress by, international st by historical standards, but it is insufficient because the goal was to reduce by two-thirds. And partly these problems with these two goals have to do with a more general problem, that progress tends to bypass those who are lowest on the economic ladder or otherwise disadvantaged because of their sex, their age, because of disability or because of ethnicity. And hardcore poverty continues to persist, particularly in much of Sub-Saharan Africa. But I still don't want you to get discouraged by those who claim that many poor countries are off track. 
The Millennium Goals were never meant to be achieved individually in every single country. They were meant to be achieved at the global level. Otherwise, the poorest countries would be placed in a huge disadvantage. For instance, if you have to half the proportion of poor people, that would require a much level, higher level of performance from a country that starts with 80% of your population below the poverty line than from a country where it's only 20%. So instead of monitoring progress per country in terms of how much on track or off track they are from the indicators and targets, it is far more relevant to actually evaluate the commitment of countries as measured by their efforts to accelerate progress to achieve these goals. And if you apply that method, if you compare the rate of improvement of indicators before and after the adoption of these Millennium Goals, then the storyline is dramatically different. Eight of the top 10 countries whose progress has accelerated most rapidly are actually from Sub-Saharan Africa. And progress amongst the least developed countries is much faster than among the average of the other developing countries. So I just want to avoid to label these countries as failures when they fail to exactly meet the target individually by 2015. Now the progress that the Millennium Goals actually spurred is unprecedented. If you look at the history over the last 60 years, many, many times at the United Nations, goals for economic and social development were set. But the degree that goals set become goals met depends very much on the degree to which these goals are known and owned publicly beyond the ivory tower of the UN diplomats, bureaucrats, and our development agencies. And in that respect, the Millennium Goals have really beaten all records. The goals have proven to have a popular power because they are clear, they're concise, they're time-bound, and they put a human face on development and have proven to be of great value as a framework for citizen action, as Oxfam has proven across the rich world. No, across the world, actually. So we live in a world of sovereign states where progress is decided, not at the UN, but by national policies, national actions, on the first seven goals by poor countries and goal eight by us, rich countries. And these goals will not be achieved at the UN. The UN can create a platform for governments to make speeches, to make commitments, but it cannot enforce countries, member states, to comply. The Secretary General of the UN cannot send the police to Germany if it doesn't live up to its commitment to achieve 0.7% of its national income for development aid. Only the citizens and the elected representatives, national parliaments, can hold governments to account for promises they make at international meetings. And governments, both in the North and the South, just need to live up at home to the commitments they already made over and over again. And governments will only translate these commitments into national policies when persistent, well-organized domestic constituencies demand so from national governments. Citizen support is key, and that's where organizations like Oxfam are key. Now, in the developing countries, you see that these Millennium Goals are continue to inspire civil society, to empower citizens to demand that their governments deliver and that they are accountable for their promises, including to improve their governance. And the quality of governance in poor countries is ultimately the decisive factor to end world poverty. And governance in poor country only improves, not by lectures of foreign donors, not by conditions to aid, but also only when their own citizens stand up and demand this and hold governments to account. Now, in developing countries, thus the Millennium Goals have had a huge impact on the priority that poor countries' governments are actually giving to issues like primary education, health, lifting the poor out of poverty. And in rich countries, they have been used effectively by civil society to educate citizens about global poverty, and they contributed to this, emer this emerging consensus, this collective conscious in rich countries that persistence of extreme poverty in an affluent world 
is morally unacceptable. So these goals have become the framework to, for campaigns to increase aid, to increase effectiveness, and for reform of the global rules of trade. And these campaigns have helped to cement the political will of the European Union members to finally set a timetable and a deadline to achieve this 0.7% of our income for development aid that we promised all Europeans decades and decades ago. And public support for these goals has been a crucial element for unpre pre unprecedented aid commitments in the European Union, even if implementation indeed has been disappointing. So the key achievement of these goals is the extent to which they have mobilized public and political support for development. And today, we're looking two and a half years from the deadline. So now we have this debate coming, what do we do after 2015? Well, now one thing is really clear to me, that any agreement about what to do about 2015 needs to maintain that popular momentum that has been created. And furthermore, these goals are all about reducing by half or by two thirds. So even if we, they're totally achieved, there is still a large unfinished agenda. What about the other half? What about the last third? So that doesn't mean to me that in the run up for 2015, we shouldn't evaluate how to improve the instruments to achieve the goals, but we should hang on to this recognition of that this is what development is about. There is one flaw that I deeply care about, and that is already recognized, and that is actually that the goals as such totally ignore issues of inequality. Progress is measured in global average, national averages, ignoring inequality issues. And this is actually lethal, because in fact, the goals will not be achieved in many countries in part because of disparities within these countries, or where they are achieved, that progress may have totally left out the very poor and the most vulnerable. Because if you only measure in national averages, then progress might reflect advances for those populations that are easiest to reach, while excluding those at highest risk. And it puts actually a premium on government action directed at those that are really already very near that threshold. So you might pull out above the threshold these accessible population across the poverty line and in the meantime even widen the gap between them and those left behind still below the threshold. That progress in averages actually masks what I call the ugly underbelly of globalization, growing inequality. And inequality was not on the political agenda when the Millennium Goals were conceived. Also proper data were lacking at the time. But since a lot has changed and it gained huge currency since, and it culminated in extensive recognition, for instance, already two years ago at the summit at the UN evaluating progress, all countries agreed to the following language. We are deeply concerned, however, that inequalities between and within countries remain a significant challenge. And we believe that combating inequality at all levels is essential to create a more prosperous and sustainable future for all. So that consensus is growing to move away from this average, to lift the floor for the most vulnerable and unprotected through social protection, to ensure that no one on earth should live below a basic income level and that everybody should at least, should at least have access to basic, very basic social services. And social protection makes sense exactly for the poorest because actually the essence of poverty is more than anything else, the permanent lack of security, be it uncertainty about where's the next meal coming from or how do we gonna deal with the next health catastrophe. The poor don't have any resources to fall back on. Now, of course, social protection for very poor countries, the financial options are limited. But it's very interesting over the last decade to see that even in some of the poorest countries in Africa, there are very successful examples of social protections, ranging from cash transfers 
to the most vulnerable, to in Rwanda extending basic health for everybody. And while economies and fiscal space grow, then levels of protection can be expanded. One of the most success stories we see in Latin America, for instance, in Brazil, uh, the Brazilian program, Bolsa Familia, actually provides cash transfers to the poorest, and it has incredibly contributed to Brazil being one of the countries where inequality is actually diminishing, as opposed to the general trend worldwide. Now, having said that, whatever future framework after 2015 we agree, reducing poverty in the poorest countries, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, will depend on adherence of rich countries, our countries, to the commitments that we made in goal eight. And if we compare the performance to achieve the goals of developing countries with the efforts that we in rich countries made, the verdict is absolutely clear, including by hard-nosed economists at the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD. It's rich countries that are lagging to implement their part of the deal achieve the 0.7, improve effectiveness of aid, and help change the international rules of trade to help poor countries to access our rich consumer markets. And I was asked to spend a few minutes on Germany. What did Germany promise? And to what extent have these promises been fulfilled? Well, Germany committed itself as a member of the EU to achieve 0.51% in 2010 and 0.7% by 2015. Germany failed and is failing these promises. Now, sir, Germany is certainly not the only country lagging its commitments. In fact, the total aid, annual aid, is somewhere 20, like $20 billion below what it would have been if all donors had stuck to their pledges. But Germany's size and the degree that Germany is lagging makes it responsible for a big chunk of that $20 billion gap between what countries promised and failed to deliver. Thus, Germany by itself deprives poor, con poor countries of billions of dollars of aid it promised, annually billions of dollars. Germany's official aid in 2011 was $14.5 billion. That is just 0.4% of national income, well below the 0.51 that it had promised to deliver already the year before. And there are no substantial increases budgeted for aid in the coming years, so it will fail to achieve the 0.7 in 2015. And even if the aid budget will spare it of cuts, it still means that Germany's debt to the poor will be some $10 billion per year the coming years. Now, if I compare Germany with other EU members, it is only Austria and the Mediterranean countries that are in crisis that do less. Now, personally, as Europe's largest and most responsible country, and given the personal commitment of, to the goals of Chancellor Mer Merkel, no one would expect Germany to rank well below the European average. It's not where Germany belongs. Now, I know that there's a lot of advocacy in Germany for this financial transaction tax to provide resources to development. But frankly, I found that discussion a bit of a smokescreen, distracting political energy from promises made over and over again to provide that 0.7. And we can talk another few decades about the financial transaction tax, as we already did the past decades. But tax issues require unanimity across 27 EU countries, and it will never happen, happen given the staunch opposition of many members, including the United Kingdom, which, by the way, is on track to achieve the 0.7 goal. The United Kingdom is in a very difficult financial situation. It's cutting to the core domestically, but keeps its promise internationally. But even if you would get agreement on your financial tax, who says that that money is going to be spent on development? 
In these days of austerity, I see all these finance ministers very happy to pocket all it, all of it for, for fiscal consolidation. And at the best, maybe some of that money will be used by some countries for global commons, like combating climate change. But that is not development aid to lift poor people out of poverty. Now let me add here that most economists actually strongly feel that countries like Germany, given all the austerity and deflation of our policies in most of the Eurozone, is actually in a superposition position to raise spending in view of the inadequate global demand. And what better way to do so than increasing your development budget? Now, let me also say a few words about the quality of aid. Alas, again, Germany also lags on commitments to improve that. It fails to deliver aid in a fashion that enables poor countries to take charge and use German aid for their programs to achieve the goals. In fact, 70%, 7-0, of German aid cannot be used by developing countries to fund their programs. Moreover, a lot of aid doesn't go, actually, to those countries, the poor, that need it. More than three quarters of German aid leaks away that cut to countries that actually do not need any external concessional assistance, and many of which have become donors themselves and are thriving economically now, even while Europe and the US are battling a recession. China, India, Brazil, they are among the 10 re largest recipients of German aid, but they're donors themselves and they're growing happily. And only less of 25% Less than 25% of German aid goes to low-income countries that need it. And in your top recipient 10 countries, there's only one low-income country, Afghanistan. So it's time for Germany not just to make serious efforts to achieve this 0.7, but also to effectively focus aid on helping poor countries to achieve the Millennium Goals instead of using it for geopolitics or lubricating export markets. Now, I know it's not the easiest time to be an advocate for the world's poor. Today, aid suffers a legitimacy crisis. And even in parts of continental Europe, where the publicly, public constituency for development assistance has been taken granted for years, like in my country, support for aid is taking a deep dive. Now, some blame that on the financial crisis, but I think it's more complicated. For example, the Netherlands and Germany, we're hardly touched by the crisis. We got the lowest unemployment rates in Europe. Still, our governments are wiggling, are attempting to wiggle out of their commitments, and we don't see much public resistance. So apparently, the campaign of some media, some politicians, saying that aid was not effective and wasted has been successful. And I find that very tragic because, yes, aid was wasted in the past, but the international community over the last decade has embarked on a serious international agreed program to improve aid effectiveness. And today there is a broad consensus based on evidence, well-documented lessons learned from mistakes and failures in the past, what contributes to aid effectiveness. And at least donors have acknowledged that they are part of the problem and committed themselves to become part of the solution. And concrete points of action have been agreed over the last decade and reconfirmed internationally just last fall in a conference in Busan. Again, Germany is below the average of the donor community in implementing these commitments. Now let me tell you what this is about. The most important lesson reflected in these commitments is that we donors must realize it is not we with our aid that develop them. They develop themselves. And they have to be responsible and they have to be in charge of their development. And without that, what we call ownership by developing countries, no aid lasts, has lasting results. Now the traditional mode of delivering aid and still much of German aid consisted of individual projects, subject to donors' procedures, often ignoring overall policies, overall responsibilities of the developing country government. And this approach 
led to a raft of small projects, uncoordinated, which even if they were successful, hardly made a dent for development. You have these little projects which are tiny islands of perfection and oceans of despair. But they collapse back into the ocean once the donor leaves. Because it's nice to build a little school or a little hospital. But who's going to pay for the maintenance? Who's going to pay the salaries of the teachers, the nurses? So it's not sustainable, doesn't last. And that old fashioned aid also inhibits good governance. Because accountability by recipient governments was to us, the donors, their paymasters, and it replaced accountability where it belongs to their own citizens, their own parliaments. Furthermore, the transaction cost of this approach of projects is huge and wasteful. Do you realize Germany is not the only donor? There are 225 bilateral donors and their donor agencies. And there are even more multilateral ones. Now imagine you're a poor recipient finance minister, minister official, and you have to deal with all of these. Each of you, each of them forcing you to follow different procedures, often while operating in the same sectors, have meetings with them individual, and prepare scores and scores of written reports to each donor, requiring often exactly the same information. Now clearly, scarce capacity in poor countries should be focused on managing their development, not their donors' programs, right? So we donors must stop thinking about our Dutch projects or our German projects. We have to start thinking about their, the developing countries' health policies, education policies, their development process. So move away from building our school, our hospital, to supporting their policies and stop imposing our donor agenda, our, our priorities and our procedures. So it's a little bit ironic, but aid effectiveness cannot increase unless we donors resist our natural temptation of wanting to control its detailed use by the recipient. And donors have signed up to this framework of ownership by developing countries. But they seem to be addicted to their micromanaging of their own euros. And at the root of this, and I understand that, is the fact that taxpayers and parliaments in our countries want to know where our tax euro is going. Does it reduce poverty? And it is critical to maintain public support in our part of the world to actually, for a development minister, and I've been there, be able to explain, yes, our money reduces poverty. The more as in most of our countries, income disparities are actually less than in many of the recipient countries. So it's only fair, as a member of parliament once told me when I was a minister, that you know, relatively poor taxpayers in our country must be assured that their development euro, tax euro, doesn't benefit these much wealthier tax avoiding elites in poor countries. But in the meantime, these same taxpayers are very often happy to give generously, as you know, to nonprofit organizations which provide livestock or seeds or training to families that struggle to, with hunger and poverty, helping these families to become self reliant. So, how can we reconcile this need to, to respect ownership from the country concerned, but still being able to tell our people, our taxpayers, that aid helps people lifting out of poverty. Well, the way to do it is use our aid way more than we're doing to finance and expand social protection. Then aid will lift people out of poor families, out of poverty directly. And these programs exist already in 45 developing countries, including in Sub-Saharan Africa. They have cash transfer programs, reaching more than 110 million families. And it's a very efficient way to reduce poverty. And they have the potential to prevent future poverty because they facilitate economic growth and promote human developments. And these programs are affordable. What I like about cash transfers is that I'm convinced that the poor know better what they need 
than policymakers. And these programs strengthen what Amartya Sen called human agency. Human agency is a person's capability to pursue and realize things that he or she values. And actually, I recognize this in something that your State Secretary Beerfels said. He said, ultimately, development policy is about giving people the freedom to lead self-determined, socially secure, and independent lives. And indeed, both the notion of social security and the free development of one's personality, which is actually Article 2 of your own Grundrechte, are deeply valued in German society. So why not translate these wonderful principles in your development policies? Because by funding social protection, Germany could both adhere to its commitments regarding aid effectiveness and ensure the Bundestag and, pay and taxpayers that aid is used for what is meant for, to lift people out of poverty. Now you wonder why do I spend so much time on Germany and what your government should be doing. But it's not just because my organ the organizer asked me to talk a bit about Germany, but also many of you are working on raising funds and implementing non-governmental projects. And many of those actually contribute to achievement of the goals, and I applaud these efforts, because every, each individual life that improve, is improved by your efforts must be, must be celebrated. But the point I want to make, that however much multiplied, these efforts will never add up to compensate for these missing billions, 10 a year, 10 billion a year, that your own government promised, but is not providing nor for the waste of billions of aid funds because your government is reluctant to implement the agreed agenda to make aid more effective. Alas, ultimately, only comprehensive government action can achieve the Millennium Goals and lift the billion plus poor sustainably out of, poverty, out of poverty. That means, of course, that first is developing countries that must do a better job heeding the needs of the poor and be accountable. So if you're engaged, in development projects, don't build schools, but help your partner, civil society there, to empower citizens to demand from their government education for all. And secondly, governments in rich countries must assist developing countries in these efforts. So the most important contribution that you can made, make is actually hold your own government to account. So let me say this in provocative terms. Your job is not just to raise funds, it is also to raise, raise voices. And what I found interesting is that in Germanic languages, as opposed to others, the word for voices and votes is the same, Stimmen. And it is indeed a bit what this is all about. Because the real problem is that government leaders come to the United Nations, make beautiful speeches and promises, take back the plane, do business as usual. And they get away with it. Living up to these promises requires public awareness, citizen advocacy, suggesting to political leaders that they will win, not lose votes, if they support policies to help achieve the Millennium Goals. So raise your voices, not just funds. Tell your politicians that you want Germany to keep this promise to achieve the 0 0.7, that you want to see this credible time path to make it. <coughs> happen in 2015, that you want your taxpayers' money to be spent effectively for poverty reduction, that you want commitments to improve the effectiveness of aid to be implemented, that you want aid to be delivered in a fashion that enables poor countries to take charge and use it for their programs to achieve the goals, instead of now the whopping 70% of German aid that cannot be used for that. Tell them that you want the aid to go to countries that need it, not to Brazil, China, India. Um, tell them that you want it to be used for poor countries and not to lubricate, lub lubricate export markets or for geopolitical policies. And really, tell them now, because there's only two and a half years left to achieve the goals. So let's act. Now, I know government leaders take their planes back home to business as usual. I don't hope that you would take the Bundesbahn train back home to the same, because we really need action. Children in 
poor countries cannot afford to wait. And I also feel that our world really cannot afford yet another generation growing up in rich countries who actually have no clue how their peers live in poor countries and how their own society actually shares responsibly, res responsibility for that plight. So what I would want to say is we are the first generation that can put an end to poverty. So please act and refuse to miss the opportunity. Thank you.